morning, good afternoon, good evening. 안녕하세요. 반갑습니다. My name is Anselmo Lee. I'm the regional coordinator of APSD, Asia Civil Society Partnership for Sustainable Development. I've been practicing and also teaching about human rights, SDG, and peace for 20 years. And today's topic is about human rights and SDG, Sustainable Development Goals, in DPRK and ROK, North Korea and South Korea. This is to help uh, you to understand the two universal norms, human rights and SDG, in the context of Korean Peninsula, in particular North and South Korea. In short, I will call North and South Korea. As you see in the screen, I brought the two images of the human rights and SDGs. Can you see the difference between the two logos? Left hand side, right hand side, you are very familiar, right? It's a UN official logo. So you will see the five continent from the top. And then left hand side, it bit looks like a uh, UN because it's olive trees, but inside, can you guess what does this stand for? There's a meaning of this logo inside. It's a five flame, right? Five flame. And what is a five? You, know? you can guess. I will explain later on, you know, my own understanding or interpretation of this logo, you know. Always human rights logo, we have a five hands. Hands up means freedom of expression. You want to speak out about human rights violation. You want to say something if something is going wrong, you know. So that's why these five fingers at the same flame, you know, like a candle. So when you organize a demonstration, we always raise up a candle, right? So this is a symbol of human rights in UN. So that's why this is a logo of UN uh, Office of Human Rights, uh, sorry, UN uh, of High Commissioner for Human Rights. As you know, we have an office in Seoul monitoring human rights situation in North Korea. So these are the two uh, symbols of topic we are going to discuss today. You know? Human rights, UN, at the same time, SDGs. So now, you see Universal Declaration of Human Rights. This is the beginning, origin of the human rights in UN, 1948. But SDG is relatively young, 2015, about seven or eight years ago. But these both are adopted by UN General Assembly. The UDHR was 1948, as I said, and then uh, SDG, 2030 Agenda, 1915, uh, 2015, by UN General Assembly. This is a common. Both are universal norms and declaration, and then adopted at the UN General Assembly. So this is another logo, interesting. This is a new one. It's not officially by UN. Can you guess, left and right? What is the title of this logo? Title of this left hand side, obviously this is SDG, right? It's a circle is SDG. In the middle, can you guess? It looks like a door piece, right? But at the same time, can you see the five fingers? So this is a logo of National Human Rights Institution. So this is a, the World Alliance of National Human Rights Institution, we call WANI. WANI, the World Alliance of National Human they adopted this one as a logo for human rights. So National Human Rights Commission means working on human rights in each country according to international human rights standard. And then right hand side, obviously it's a Korean Peninsula map, right? So Korean Peninsula in SDG. So obviously this symbolizes human rights and SDG in the Korean Peninsula. That's why I pick up this logo from the Google. So you can find the Google in this logo. So now, let's go back to a little bit the history of both human rights and SDG. This is a, a history photo of UN General Assembly. But it seems the building is a different, right? Both are UN General Assembly, but 1948, can you guess where it was? 48. And 2015, obviously it's a UN General Assembly Hall, right? We are familiar with this one. But left hand side, it was not New York. It was in Paris. At that time, I think the UN headquarters in New York was under construction. 
So this uh, third UN General Assembly was held in Paris, the uh, Palais de Chaillot. So next to the Eiffel Tower, there is a, a beautiful the building called Palais de Chaillot. There, the UN General Assembly was held in 1948. And the behind, there is an old uh, emblem, the national flag of the older UN members. That time, I think the 48 the, the states, not many. No? But today, how many UN member states? 193. No? That's why we don't have any more national flag on, on the world. That's impossible. No? So, but atmosphere, of course, is a bl uh, black and white. It's a colorful. But when SDG was adopted, it was really festive mood, you know, because people were so excited. After three years negotiation, finally, all the delegations of the UN member states unanimously, unanimously adopted SDG. You know? Do you remember the history? 1948, UDHR was not adopted unanimously. You know? It was a put on voting. So there was, a, there was no vote against. The majority vote in favor, there was a, some abstain. You know? That shows already 1948, although it was adopted by UN General Assembly, it was not unanimously adopted. But unlike UDHR, 2015, SDG was adopted unanimously. That's the reason that the, almost all the countries participating in this uh, SDG uh, implementation. But when it comes to human rights, it has been from the beginning controversial politically, but it was only 2000. Eight, the UPR, Indonesia UPR, Universal Period Review, which I'm going to explain soon. And then the, all the member states participate in this implementation of UPR. You know? So the 1948, the name of the document was the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. But only 2008, that means how many years? 60, uh, 70 years later universally implemented in the name of UPR. Okay, that's a little bit difference between the human rights and SDG. So now, 2023 is a big year for both human rights and SDG. The human rights, obviously, this is the 75th anniversary of Universal Declaration of Human Rights. At the same time, there's a Vienna World Conference on Human Rights, 1993, plus 30. At the same time, 1998, there was a UN General Assembly adopted Human Rights Defender Declaration. So these are triple anniversaries, 75, 30, and 25. These symbolize the historical up and down, you know, evolution of human rights. As I said, 1948 it was a, the beginning of the so-called universal human rights because it was adopted by the UN General Assembly. But after some time, because of Cold War, political the environment, human rights was not able to make a progress because of you know, the East and West. You know? They are uh, fighting, they are blocking each other. So, but only after collapse of World War, 1993, the both blocs, the so-called socialists or communists or liberal capitalists, they were able to come together, agree on some basic human rights principle. Today we call universality, interdependence, interrelatedness, and so on. You know? So finally, uh, we have a common basis and foundation to establish UN human rights mechanism. That's why OACCHR, Office of High Commissioner for Human Rights, was established only 1995, two years after Vienna. You know? Because both sides, a majority of the country, they were able to agree on creating the human rights structure. But before that, it was too political. Both sides, they were very reluctant to agree on human rights. And then 1998, this was a very symbolic. 1998 means uh, this is a, a 50th anniversary, right? 50th anniversary of UDHR, UN General Assembly adopted another historical document we call Human Rights Defender Declaration. Because they believe in order to implement UDHR on the ground, we need to really protect human rights defenders because they are the forefront of implementing the, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. 
That's why uh, next year there will be a lot of uh, events and activities to commemorate the three UDHR, Vienna, Human Rights Defender. And in this historical context, when it comes to North Korean human rights, next year, so, uh, first UN Human Rights Council resolution on uh, human rights in DPRK, 2003. But that time, it was a Commission on Human Rights. As you know, uh, Human Rights Council was created in 2006, replacing the CHR, Commission on Human Rights. At the same time, 10 years after first resolution, there, there was not much progress on human rights in North Korea. That's why UN decided to create a Commission of Inquiry, COI, 2013. So next year, 2023, is a double anniversary, 20th anniversary of first resolution, at the same 10th anniversary of Commission of Inquiry. So now about SDG and peace. As you know, from 2010 to 2030, UN declared the UN Decade of Action to deliver the SDG by 2013. And next year is a halfway of 50-year journey from 2016 to 2030. That's why UN is organizing second SDG summit. So once every four years, you know, once every four. The first summit was 2019, and the second summit next year. So another big year for SDG. At the same time, uh, 2023 is like a UDHR. This was a national division of Korea. You know why 48? Not because. As you know, Korea was liberated from uh, Japanese colonial rule in 45. And then Korea both, uh, Korea went under so-called Trustship Council by America and United Nations. When they both North and South Korea, they tried to negotiate for the United government, but they failed. You know? Finally, they decided to have a separate election, South Korea and North Korea. It was in 1948. So it was officially uh, division, the you know, confirmation of division between North and South Korea, you know. So 75th anniversary. And also there is an armistice of the ceasefire of Korean War, which lasted for three years. So uh, July 27. So this was another 70th anniversary. So 2003, see, human rights and SDG and peace. Human rights, both universal and also Korea. So very symbolic, 2023. So let's keep this in mind. When you organize any activities next year, 2003, whether it's a human rights, peace, and SDG, I think it's all interconnected. That's why I'm introducing this uh, important anniversaries for your the action. So now let's come to the substantive issue of human rights and SDG. So now we are trying to address both, not silo separately. So there are four different ideal types of relationship between the human rights and SDG. And now I'm saying it's very naturally, oh, human rights and SDG, but in reality, many people don't work on both. Some group only working on human rights, or the other group SDG. Even some, those who are working on SDG, they are very reluctant to engage human rights. Because they believe, not all, but some of them believe human rights are very political. You know? And those who engage human rights, they see SDG is sometimes SDG washing. You know? They are not political enough. They are not critical enough. So there is not much substantive dialogue between the human rights group and SDG group on the ground in South Korea too. You know? If you go to United States, Europe too, you know? so all separate. But when it comes to UN, because both UDHR and SDG was adopted by UN General Assembly, all the UN agencies, all the UN system, they are supposed to integrate human rights and uh, SDG because basically both are addressing the same issues on the ground. You know? So there is a lot of convergence and also collaboration and cooperation among all UN agencies. So, but in general, history speaking, in the beginning, SDG without human rights. This was the main, the mainstream, you know. Many, those are working on SDG, as I said, they want to do SDG without human rights for political reasons or other reasons. And then, after some time, they realize, oh, SDG and human rights, they are addressing similar issues or same issues. So, it has to go together, hand in hand, you know, SDG with the human rights. 
And then some even say SDG for human rights. If you implement SDG successfully, it will contribute to the realization of human rights. And today, and then the final stage uh, is SDG through human rights. So SDG for human rights means a result. It's a result of the SDG implementation. Human rights is a result of SDG implementation, but the SDG through human rights means process also very important. Not only for human rights, but also you have to apply human rights principle in the implementation process of SDG. So there's a formulation, uh, HRBA, human rights based approach to SDG or human rights based approach to developed cooperation. So, um, but not everybody, not every CSO, not every UN agency really implement SDG through human rights. But UNDP and OHHR, they have been working together to promote this uh, human rights based approach to SDG. So you can find uh, a lot more materials and information at the Google or uh, website about this approach. So now we are beginning of the, this SDG through human rights. So let's look at a bit more uh, details in the human rights in SDG. I'm sure you are all familiar with the 17 SDGs, right? 17 goals. And then 17 goals is composed of 5P. You know, P, uh, people, prosperity, planet, peace, and partnership, right? So, and then where can you find the human rights in SDG? According to the research, one research, and more than 90% of the SDG targets are about human rights. So now this shows which human rights and which goals and targets. Number one is the ESCR right, economic, social, cultural right, and civil and political right. So economic, social, cultural right, this SDG 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. That means in the area of people, social development, and also economic development. SDG 1 is a Poverty, SDG 2, hunger, 3, uh, health for education, 6, water, 7, energy, 8, the decent work. These are the all important human rights we call economic, social, cultural rights. And then when it comes to civil and political rights, usually SDG 16, there are a lot of the target related to civil and political rights. For instance, target 16, 3, this is about the rule of law. 1610, the right to information and fundamental freedoms. So you can say generally, economic, social, cultural rights, goal 1, 2, 15. But 13, 14, 15, climate, ocean, and land, this is about environmental rights. So instead of economic, social, cultural rights, you can say economic, social, environmental rights. Because 1945, when UDHR was adopted, environment was not the main concern of the human rights community. You know? But now, obviously, you know, uh, a lot of environmental human rights is a part of human rights um, the framework. Then also you can find the many um, SDG goals and targets related to equality and non-discrimination. For instance, SDG 5, SDG 10, and also target 4.7, and also 16B. And human rights education specifically mentioned in the target 4.7. So only once the human rights, the word human rights appear only once in 169 target, that is target 4.7. And lastly, business and human rights also becoming more and more important because private sector play a very important role in implementing the SDG. But business and human rights, it's not part of the goal or target, but it appears in the uh, 2030 agenda document. So if you go to the paragraph 67 of 2030 agenda, you can find the word guiding principle on business and human rights, which means those who engage SDG implementation, private sector, they need to respect guiding principle on business and human rights. So these are the some of the uh, uh, international human rights norms and standards related to the SDG implementation. Okay, so now let's look at a little bit more in detail about comparison between the UDHR and 20th agenda. 
As I said, it was adopted 1948 and then 1915, the 10th of December and September 25th, where UN General Assembly, 3rd UN General Assembly and 70th UN General Assembly in New York and Paris. Main content, uh, UDHR, and uh, we have a preamble and the 30 articles. 30 articles composed of ESCR right and then civil and political right. And then the SDG, 17 SDGs, including 169 target and the under 5P, so like a cluster, you know. The, peop, uh, the people stand for social development, prosperity, economy development, planning for environment, and goal 16, peace, and then goal 17, partnerships. In terms of monitoring and follow up, as I said, there's no uh, follow uh, monitoring mechanism following UDHR. It was only, uh, Universal Period Review was only 2008, very late, you know, 60 years later. But uh, SDG immediately, so they introduced program uh, VNR, Voluntary National Review, where all the UN member states, they are invited to present their own report at the UN. You know? So there's a big difference in terms of monitoring and follow mechanism. And UDHR, as you know, uh, this UPR three times a year, and then once every four or five years. So that means all the UN member states, they come to Geneva to make a presentation about their commitment and their implementation of the, the human rights. But SDG, uh, from 2016, but it's not as systematic as UPR. You know? So UPR, already we have completed the uh, three cycles starting from 2008. So that means all the UN member states, at least three times, they have participated in the UPR. But SDG, unfortunately, is not uh, systematic at all. You know? So very voluntary, as, as the name you know, stands for, Voluntary National Review, which means it's up to national government. So some country every two years, some country every three years, some country irregular, you know. So uh, compared to UPR, VNR is very loose, very depend on the voluntar voluntary uh, political will of the member state. So when it comes to Korea, so uh, South Korea attended um, Three, both North and South Korea has attended three the UPR, but fourth UPR, South Korea will be Feb January or February 2023, but North Korea will be 2024. But when it comes to SDG, South Korea was 2016, year after adoption of SDG, the first the VNR, and the North Korea was last year, 2021, but both only once, only once. Unlike other countries, for instance, um, Indonesia already three times, Philippines already three times, almost every two or three years, very regular. That shows they are really committed to the SDG, but unfortunately, both South and North Korea is not as good as other countries in Asia. But better than nothing, we have two countries, United States and Myanmar, they have never attended the uh, VNR. You know? So compared to the US, it's a better, but it's not as good as uh, other countries uh, in Asia. And domestic implementation, uh, once, as you know, uh, after UPR, you get recommendation from the, the member states and also UN, and the, all these recommendations will go into National Action Plan, you know, NAP, National Human Rights Action Plan, and then they implement it. So already South Korea, these three times, every four or five years, National Action Plan. So now South Korea is going to adopt the next one, but North Korea, no National Action Plan, unfortunately. And when it comes to SDG, and South Korea have a 20 year long term basic plan on sustainable development. So currently, I think this is the fourth one, 2021 to 2014. And also South Korea adopted the KSDG, that means in line with the uh, global SDG 2018 and also 2022. Two years later, they revised. You know? But North Korea, 
not North Korea SDG, but they have their own um, economic plan. You know, every five years, North Korea has an economic development plan and also a strategic framework with the UN. So these are the reference document and also policy framework for implementation of SDG. So you can see the comparison between the South Korea and North Korea in terms of SDG and human rights. So now let's go a little bit more in detail about human rights and SDG in both countries. So this is the, the cover of the strategic framework uh, document, which can be, I think, the only official the UN document uh, being uh, implemented in North Korea, because this is a joint the project of UN and the DPRK. You know? So these are the three uh, official documents in uh, North Korea. First one is a National Five-Year Economic Development Plan, and then UN uh, HL, HLPF, High Level Political Forum, the VNR, the North Korea participated, and also UN Strategic Framework. The top one, five-year economic plan, is a main uh, North Korean official document incorporating some of the elements from the VNR and also UN strategic framework. So you need to look at these three if you want to understand how the SDG is implemented in North Korean context. So this is a photo of the ambassador Kim Sung. He's a North Korean ambassador to uh, UN in New York. And this is a cover of the Vienna report in uh, DPRK 2021. So let's compare now the human rights and SDG and between DPRK and ROK. I want to show the history of human rights and SDG in both countries. As you know, uh, both countries joined the UN only in 1991, the year after collapse of Cold War. You know? That means before, during Cold War, both countries tried to join United Nations against each other. So if South Korea tried, and then Soviet Union at that time, today uh, Russia, they veto. If North Korea joined, and United States veto. So they were not able to join United Nations. They were competing. You know? So finally they gave up, because political, whole global political structure has completely changed. You know? So they compromised, okay, let's join together. That's why it was it was only 1991, you know, about uh, 33 years ago. And then both countries uh, began to join all kinds of UN activities officially as a member of UN. After some time, the, when it comes to North Korea, the first human rights uh, resolution of DPRK 2023. Of course, before that, I think in 1997 or 1998, there was a UN Subcommission on Human Rights, they also adopted resolution uh, before, but uh, when it comes to the Human Rights Council, it was only 2003. And the first UPR, 2009. South Korea was 2008. And then strategic framework and the Commission of Inquiry and the Seoul Office. Two years after the Commission of Inquiry report, according to recommendation of the COI, the UN decided to create an OHSR office in Seoul. You know? Okay, this is a before the adoption of 2030 agenda in 2015. Very interestingly, uh, very historical, very interesting political development after Pyeongchang uh, Winter Olympic Games. As you know, there's a first summit in June 2018 in Singapore between the DPRK US. It's the first. The, the, the summit between two countries. And, and then this uh, February, after that we have uh, Pyongyang, the November, uh, sorry, the September 2019, there was a DPRK ROK summit. The former president Moon Jae-in, he visited Pyongyang. I think this was the most exciting time of the modern history in Korean Peninsula, you know. Until the second, the DPRK US summit in Hanoi, you know, so called no deal, you know, no progress. You know? So that time, many people really believe, oh, reunification is really coming, you know, it, it soon become a reality, you know. But 
it, 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 it took not much time to uh, many people now disillusioned, you know, about political reality is not that simple, you know, so complicated, you know. So after Hanoi, everything went back to zero, you know, even before uh, Pyeongchang Olympic. So there was no more dialogue, but very interestingly, nevertheless, North Korea continued to participate UN mechanism, the UPR and also the SCG, because they believe both this UPR and VNR are universal. That means it's not targeting North Korea, it's a, every country as a UN member state, they have a right to participate and also they have a responsibility to participate. So North Korea side, they want to show, you know, we are, we are normal, we are one of the UN member states, we are practicing the international norms in spite of the sanction against North Korea because of nuclear tests by UN Security Council. I think that's a very important point. That's why some of you are paying attention to this, the UPR and the VNR, in spite of all the complicated international politics, still these two mechanisms are working, both North Korea and South Korea, and also many uh, UN member states. So, as we see after the Hanoi, uh, this uh, uh, third UPR, North Korea, and also VNR, and the UPR 4, uh, Desert 2024. So this is going on, the UPR and the VNR. And South Korea, of course, South Korea attended the UPR 4, uh, um, is going to attend the UPR 4 next year, and also uh, VNR. You know? so, so my question is, how we can use uh, VNR and UPR to promote human rights and SDG in both countries. I'm not saying this, will, this is a solution to all the problem, never, you know. But this can create a political space where we can do more, you know. Starting from this uh, universal uh, the mechanism, UPR and the VNR. Because UPR recommendation, as you know, after UPR, there are a lot of recommendations. And then the member states, can decide which recommendation accept or reject or pending, you know. So that means there's a commitment of the, the member states, like North Korea and South Korea. That means we can use those commitments to, uh, to advocate and also put pressure and also engage with the North Korea about human rights improvement. For that, I think UPR and VNR both are very useful, although uh, it does not really uh, solve all the structural problems of North and South Korea. So that's a point why we are paying attention to human rights and SDG in both countries. Let's look at a little bit more detail. There's very interesting data called SDSN. SDSN is, uh, stands for Sustainable Development Solution Network. This is an international NGO or research group initiated by Jeffrey Sachs, the well-known American economist. From 2016, they developed the indicators, SDG index, making use of all the existing international data. They collect all the data, and then according to glo uh, global indicators, they organize this data. They show the uh, like infographic like this. So you can see the arrow going on means uh, improving or stagnant or going backward, you know. And also you can see from the color, green, yellow, brown, and red. Very interestingly, North and South Korea, can you see which color same, common? All four, all four, education, both are green, right? There's only green goal for both and North South Korea. And then both countries have a two red, 14 and 15, North and South Korea red. Very interesting. And South Korea have only one green and North Korea three greens. Of course, you can question the reliability of this data, but nevertheless, this gives us some very new perspective because usually many people say, oh, South Korea is much better and the SG implementation, and North Korea is very backward. But according to the data, it's opposite. North Korea has three greens. This is very interesting. 
But when it comes to SG16, which is a civilian political right, of course, North Korea is red, you know. But gray color means no data available. So data is a big challenge for North Korea. So goal one and goal, goal one poverty, goal 10 inequality, and goal 17, no data available for North Korea. And, and also very interesting, goal 10 is inequality. So South Korea is red. So that means you can see the social uh, you know, polarization and also economic inequality is one of the worst in the world. You know? So this data can um, give some the perspective how we can address both North and South Korea in terms of SDG. You know? But many people see, oh, North Korea is bad, you know, they are human rights terrible, they are poor, they are... But when it comes to climate and environment, it's opposite, you know. Because one country is too much food, the other country too little food, you know. So I think we need to have a new perspective about uh, reality of North and South Korea in terms of SDG and the human rights. These data, although it's not scientifically 100% reliable, but gives some kind of perspective, you know. Let's go a little bit deeper. This is a four-year trend for you from 2018-19 to 2021. Can you see any interesting trend this to both uh, South Korea and North Korea? Let's look at the green first. South Korea, goal four. Goal four is education. South Korea last two years, 2020-2021, uh, green. North Korea, green. It's very interesting. Right? And then goal 12. What is the goal 12? Goal 12 is a sustainable consumption and production. South Korea is a brown. That means not very good. North Korea, green. I was very curious. How come North Korea, green? That means no, no uh, consumption and production. <laughs> Ironically, yeah? that's also green, you know. So I don't know that it's, uh, we can say it's, it's sustainable, but nevertheless, according to data, North Korea is green. Salting is so very interesting. The climate, climate change. South Korea is all red, you know. So much pollution, you know, production of CO2. But North Korea green. Why? Because no industrialization, no air pollution. That's green, you know. And then goal 14 and 15, and 14 is the ocean, North Korea red, and then 15, also the land, you know, the diversity. And 16, obviously, uh, all red, you know, North Korea, uh, 19, 20, 21 red. And then, as I said, you know, the, the one, goal one, and goal 10, goal 17, no data available, unfortunately. Goal 17, South Korea, all red, you know. So South Korea has a three red, you know, goal five, goal 13, goal 17. Goal five also very interesting. South Korea, goal five means gender equality. South Korea red, North Korea yellow. How can you interpret? It's very interesting, you know, this one. You know. And goal two, goal three, goal two is a hunger, of course, North Korea red. And goal three, health, North Korea red, you know. So now you can see the which one common trend and which are the contrast you know, between the North and South Korea. You know. I think this also gives some perspective where we can develop more cooperation. You know. And then what are the challenging areas in North Korea and South Korea? You know. Because when it comes to environment, you know, climate does not discriminate North and South Korea. You know. So uh, when it comes to climate, especially the climate change, and there should be a more innovative approach to address climate change. Not only South and North Korea, it's a geographical area, but this is more the natural, so-called planetary boundary equation in the whole Korean Peninsula. So this uh, index data shows how can you understand social, political, and also economic reality of both countries in the context of Korean Peninsula. And this one is a country-specific data and the South Korea, uh, out of 165 countries, the relatively high, 28, 28 from the top, and North Korea, unfortunately, no data, too much data not available, so, not, so we don't know. But from, 
I think gas not very high or middle. I think it's a bottom, you know, uh, among 165 countries. So this is a comparison between the two countries. And then a little bit more data about both countries. As I said, uh, KSDG, South Korea and North Korea, they adopted their own SDG, which means a national SDG. So SDG basically is a universal. It was a global adopted by UN General Assembly, 17 goals and 169 target, and also 231 global indicators. So all the UN agencies, they produce monitor report according to these global indicators. But South Korea, 2018 and 2020, second time, they adopted the KSDG, and then only 122 targets and 214 indicators. That means not all the universal targets are applicable, relevant in the South Korean context. So they pick up some which are relevant, they removed or they modified the some target according to South Korean context. But North Korea even much less, the 95 uh, target and the 132 indicators. And Vienna, as he already explained, South Korea first, 2016. That means the last six, seven years, no VNR. So some NGOs are questioning, is it really South Korea committed to the SDG? How come only uh, last seven years, no, no um, the action about VNR? But, but North Korea is much later, 2021. You know? Okay, so these are the, some basic data in terms of the implementation mechanism between North and South Korea. And now, this is very interesting data. As I said outset, the OHCHR, which is a UN human rights body, trying to analyze all the, the UPR recommendation in terms of SDGs. So they count, they counted the number of recommendations according to the SDGs. So these are results. Uh, out of uh, total number of the recommendations, the DPRK, 30% recommendation relate to the SG16, the civilian political right, and South Korea, 23%. So very, but it's not only North and South Korea, almost all, more than 90% of the member states uh, that participate in the UPR, SG16 was on top. Because basically, human rights, uh, civilian political rights. So, uh, no exception, North and South Korea. But difference is goal five and goal eight, both countries. The South Korea is on top uh, two, number two, and North Korea number three. And then goal eight, decent job. You know, this work was uh, both. On the contrary, goal two, goal three, the goal to hunger and goal three health only for North Korea. Goal 10, inequality, and goal for education, only South Korea. So you can see the, what are the differences in terms of economic, social realities in North and South Korea. You know? This also gives another perspective. You know? If you want to develop any developed cooperation project in the future, but now because of you know, hostile, confrontational political situation, we cannot carry out any developed cooperation project, but who knows? So once, you know, again, the more dialogue and peace, and then we can have a lot of development projects, and this can give some data perspective, you know, how we can develop for North Korea and also joint program between the North and South Korea. You know. So I think this is also a way to link SDG to human rights. Because as I said, 90% of the uh, the targets of the SDG are about human rights. But now question is, as I said, it's not only uh, about human rights, the through human rights, human rights based approach to human rights. But positive note is when it comes to the uh, strategic framework, UN strategic framework on North Korea, there is a mention about human rights and also human rights based approach. That means North Korea is open to implement human rights based approach to SDG. So this is uh, the chance for uh, collaboration, especially the between no, uh, human rights and SDG.
So lastly, let me show you an uh, interesting diagram. So now we are talking about both North and South Korea. It's a divided Korea. So we have a SGG and human rights and peace security. These are the three global norms and also it shows a reality on the ground in the Korean Peninsula. So between SGG and human rights, we have a democratic governance, Goal 16. So we need a civic space, we need a, de a democratic government to implement human rights and SDG. It's like a cross-cutting. And between human rights and peace is a humanitarian affairs. You know, there are a lot of separated family issues, you know, kidnapping issues, you know, the POW, uh, prisoner of war. There are a lot of uh, human rights, humanitarian issues related to human rights and peace. At the same time, SGGMP, we have a humanitarian assistance. We have a lot of natural disaster or man-made disaster. So this is also an area for developed cooperation. So there are so many issues in North Korea and also so many issues related to both North and South Korea. So this is a, like a paradigm to put the issues, three circles, SDG human rights and the human, SDG human rights and peace. But as I said, some many uh, civil society organizations in South Korea, they are, their approach is very siloed. You know? Some group only human rights, civil and political rights. Some group only peace and unification. Some group only SDG. But these are all interrelated. You know? So this is a human rights principle, universality and interdependence, interrelated news. So SDG can provide very interesting, very comprehensive framework where you can link human rights and peace. Because remember the goal 16, title is a peace. Although there are more justice, the content, but nevertheless, peace is considered as a, one of the important pillars of SDG. That's why I personally believe, in spite of all the limitations, structural limitations of SDG, SDG can be useful, can be effective, if both the government, North and South Korean government, and also civil society understand the SDG is a more contextual manner and implement more contextual way. And then I think it can have some positive impact for the improvement of human rights and also peace on Korean Peninsula. So this is my personal uh, conclusion and also conviction. That's why I'm committed to SDG and human rights, which can be very important for uh, peaceful unification or peace and human security in Korean Peninsula. Okay, thank you very much for your listening. So I'm happy to answer your question. So first of all, thank you for this very informative and very interesting lecture. Um, one of the questions that is, it's just something that is scratching my mind right now. From everything, it sounds like the international community has been acting as a evil stepmother to the <laughs> North Korea. From the simple data that we're looking at, it it seems like the DPRK is doing so much more than ROK. So why are we having this kind of a evil stepmother attitude towards DPRK? Of course, not forgetting about all the human rights issues that are happening, but it's it's kind of evil from us to disregard it. There could be some um, step forward into a better and more sustainable future, or or am I wrong? I don't know. Um, I think your perspective is very, very interesting. Yes, that's true, you know, because uh, in international media describe North Korea as like a hell, you know, a lot of problems, dictator, all the bad things. And then, but obviously, uh, North Korea also, the socialism with the human faith, there are people living, like ordinary people in South Korea, anywhere in the world, you know. So I think we need to look at the more human face of North Korean society, you know. Uh, of course, they are part of North Korean regime, you know, they are citizens, but we, we, we don't know whether they really support or they are very frustrated or they are against, you know, because there's no political freedom, they have to survive, you know. That's why I think this SCG gives us a new perspective to look at the human face of North Korean society, you know. That does not mean, you know, we need to it can justify the North Korea regime human rights violation. We need to criticize human rights violation in North Korea according to international standard. You know, 
like any other country, right? There's a human rights violation in South Korea, United States, everywhere. So we need to criticize. Government is accountable to all these human rights violations. But demonizing North Korea does not really address real problems. So we have to find a way, you know? One way, public condemnation about the government policy, not people, you know? But we need to pay attention to human face. So this data shows a little bit of that perspective, you know? Yeah. So as um, Isidora said, uh, the presentation showed um, pretty good data about what North Korea has been doing to follow the SDGs targets. So um, considering this, uh, do you think that this will help shape the perception of human rights in the territory as a less political entity on the long run? And more generally, what do you think the future of cooperation between North Korea and the UN might be? Oh, that's also very interesting. So when it comes to human rights, I think we need to have a, put the time in the human rights uh, analysis. Human rights violation of the past, human rights violation of the present, human rights violation of the future. For the climate crisis, obviously, of course, many countries are affected by climate change, right? like a, a big flood in Pakistan. And also very interesting, in COP27, Conference of Parties to UN Climate Convention on Climate Change, first they agreed to compensate, you know, uh, the, the flood in Pakistan by rich countries. Because historically speaking, the so-called industrialized countries, they are more accountable to climate change, right? So when it comes to North Korea, in terms of the climate change, South Korea is more responsible than North Korea, right? So, so that's why we have to find the so and also uh, this stage UN we have a special rapporteur on climate change and human rights. Only in 2021. That means human rights, uh, climate change become part of human rights issues. So, but traditionally we look at only the civil and political. Of course, freedom of expression and then the torture. North Korea was one of the worst human rights record. You know, obviously, you no. Know? But when it comes to economy, social, cultural rights, or environmental rights, opposite. But it very much depends who is responsible. Is the state or so-called uh, the out of the country, the international community, you know? what we call technically extraterritorial obligation issues. You know? So it's a very complex you know, human rights, some domestic, some international. So I think we need to have a more holistic uh, understanding about human rights in North Korea, you know, mm -hmm. in terms of also the accountability, you know, who is accountable, you know. So, that, so my suggestion is while we are continuing to monitor human rights violations, especially the civil and political rights committed by the North Korean <laughs> regime, we need to also look at other types of human rights violations. At the, at the end of the day, it is the people, you know. People die, some by torture and malnutrition or famine, and also people are dying because of disaster caused by the climate change. You know? But when it comes to climate change, it is a collective responsibility of all the states. You know? That's why maybe that gave us the new ways of collaboration or cooperation on the climate change as a human rights. You know? So that gives a new uh, entry point into the human rights. So important thing is how can you make North Korea more open to collaborate on human rights issues to address all the environmental issues and, and so on. So my conclusion is we, although international norms and system, we have a clear division of labor, human rights, SDG, and climate. But when it comes to people on the ground, same, same people, you know, same people. That's why we need to have that uh, the holistic perspective. That's the reason that I introduced SDG and human rights and peace. Thank you. So you said that we're going to have the second uh, SDG summit soon as a halfway point, to a kind of a checkup mark. And since we're going to have this uh, MUNSF uh, conference happening in February, and probably could be interesting for our participants to know, do you think it could be a good opportunity to revisit some of the kind of a the ties that maybe have died down due to the COVID uh, restrictions. We know that all the resident coordinators in DPRK have left 
and we have extended the, the strategic framework until 2023. But is this maybe a good opportunity to um, have one of these unofficial peace talks or more like talks into the future or something that could happen to foster and build this strategic framework even stronger? As, as you said, it is the only working document um, by the UN and international community in DPRK. But, you know, the, the presence of UN agencies in North Korea, mainly because of COP19, right? Yes. So all the out because of COP19. That means even before COP19, when there was no, uh, politically was not very uh, open, and there was a, the role played by the UN, you know? So I believe once COVID is down, and then they will open up, and then UN agencies come back, I think this uh, UN FC summit can be a good opportunity because this is a universal effort to review the implement whole SDG, including North Korea. So I think this gives us a new opportunity for UN to play the role inside the country, and especially the OSHL data can be very interesting, you know, because uh, I like this data very much because it's a universal and it's all official data produced by the member states themselves, you know. So there's a credibility and also there is a responsibility of the member states. So they cannot say no because they are the one who produce this data, you know. So this can be basis for collaboration and analysis and also policy dialogue with the North Korea. Thank you. Uh, my next question is actually related to data. <laughs> um, so since we saw that um, this type of data are submitted by uh, each country voluntarily, um, and considering the difficulty of gathering data in North Korea, even by the North Korean government, uh, do you think there is a possibility that North Korea might be fixing some numbers? And if no, why? And if yes, how much? Okay, there are two types of data. One type of data produced by North Korea used for Vienna report. Vienna report. The other one, SDSN, Social Develop uh, what's the Solution Network data, the, this SEN group, they collected the existing data, of course, some produced by the North Korea, but by the UN and other agencies. It's a mixed, you know. But, but obviously, we cannot 100% believe in all this data, you know. So, but this data can be an indication of the ground reality, you know. So I don't really use this data as very scientific, and the, but you can use as a, a tool for further dialogue and the research and monitoring, you know. So this is an indication. That's why I want to stress. And also global data is very much limited, you know, because global data means if there is no internationally comparable data, we cannot use those data for global indicators. So very limited, you know, very selective as well, you know. Mm -hmm. And also this is by the Jeffrey Sachs group. I don't think Jeffrey Sachs group is, you know, the conservative one. It's, I, I consider neutral, you know, neutral. Because, well, and also they are collaborating with, the, I think, Cambridge University. You know? So they bring as much as by all the scientific research group to improve the, you know, the quality of data. But the question, interpretation is okay, but problem is the low data itself. Unless North Korea produce low quality low data, we cannot really use, you know, uh, have a very good uh, analysis. There's a limitation, but nevertheless, it's an indication. It can be very useful, yeah. Thank you. Do you have any words of encouragement or any advice that you would like to give to our model UNSF 2023 participants and something that you can leave us as your final remarks? So my, uh, I don't know whether I can use the word of uh, encouragement, but uh, my advice can be, uh, you know, the issue of North Korea is very complex, you know. It's all, you know, combination of human rights and peace and security and also environmental disaster or develop, everything is there, you know. So you can choose entry point, either human rights anger or peace and security, unification or develop cooperation. It's okay, it's up to your choice, you know. But it's important to understand the interconnectedness, you know, interdependency of the human rights and peace and development. Then we can have a more durable solution, you know, because North Korea issue has been too much politicized, as you know very well, you know. And also those who are working on North Korea, they are not sometimes, they don't talk, you know. They don't trust each other, you know. So this is a big problem, you know. So I think we need to go beyond this uh, ideological division 
and trying to address uh, issues on the ground. And that's why I said the human face, you know, we are not fighting for people. We are not fighting against people in North Korea, right? The regime, you know. So I think we need to distinguish, you know, the official policy by the regime and also ordinary people, you know. So in that sense, I think we, uh, we need to try uh, to understand North Korea. Of course, we cannot go to North Korea. But there are many North Korean defectors who are in South Korea. So I think we need to talk to them, understand them, through them understand the North Korean the system, both political and social. And also, since we are, many of you are in South Korea, the way we look at North Korea from South Korean point of view is very different from international community. You know? Somehow there's a huge gap between the South Korean general public and also international community. You know? So I think that's very, very important, how to bridge the gap between the international community and South Korea. Probably this program can give us a very good opportunity to bridge the gap you know, between the international community and South Korea. All the best. Thank you. Thank you.